All right, so today we are going to talk about static failure theories uh, and specifically ductile failure. In the next lecture, we'll go over uh, brittle failure. And uh, these failure theories are the foundation of how we evaluate uh, machine uh, safety and uh, our designs. So we'll, um, in mechanical engineering, most of what we do is design against we design for function and then we have to design against failure. Okay, so we've reviewed how do we how do we get forces at certain locations. We've reviewed uh, how those forces uh, result in stresses. We found that we need to find the locations on an object that have the highest stresses. Uh, we can find those from our shear, from our load, shear, uh, and uh, bending moment diagrams and find the different stresses at different locations okay and then we need to find out if these uh, stresses are sufficient to cause failure and so we're going to talk about the background of how we derived our uh, static failure criteria and just as a note remember that there's videos and examples for many of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, uh, mainly for the rest of the semester different components <clears throat> there's some example videos um, they're dated uh, but there's good content there, so don't forget to check out uh, those Norton videos as well as you go through some of these materials. Uh, now we said that what we care about when we design is we want to create a safety. We want to know what a what the safety factor of our design is, and that is uh, the uh, yield stress in many cases, or the, the the failure stress divided by the stress that's experienced by the uh, artifact <clears throat> okay and we always want the safety factor to be greater than one because if it's one then failure is likely and so this is just the recommendation this is from chapter one of the book we talked about this at the beginning of the semester when you want to pick a safety factor these are some guidelines to help you uh, understand what safety factor you need okay so in the ideal case you know, you have test data on the material, you have high confidence in material, uh, the conditions that uh, services uh, are identical to um, the test conditions, and you have experimental data to validate all your designs. And in that case, you pick a safety factor of the max of all these safety factors, which would be 1.3. So you'll notice that as we go down here, um, this is really the uncertainty in what we uh, in the design and the uncertainty associated with the things that we don't know. Okay? And that's related to the material property, the environmental property, and the, the analysis uh, tools that we have used or have available for that design. Okay, so the more, more uncertain you are, the higher you have to pick your safety factor. And you see they go from 1.3 all the way to 5. And you can separate this <clears throat> based on material, environment, and uh, available data, right? So for the uh, loading condition for that machine or that machine element. Okay, so any, anywhere you have uncertainty, you have to account for that greater uncertainty. Now, if we have a brittle material, we have to have a safety factor that's recommended to be twice uh, of these tables. And these are just general guidelines. These are what I would call your undergraduate <laughs> guidelines. Uh, the American Standards for Tests and Measurement, the ASTM and ANSI and many other organizations for specific applications have additional data on how to do this. For example, if you're designing structural elements, uh, there's, there's guidelines for that <clears throat> uh, for building construction. Uh, there's guidelines for testing material data and there's um, a lot more detail here. This is just a very high level um, sort of back of the envelope type design for us to get to um, get to a design that we can go and embody and add details to from those other sources. Okay, <clears throat> um, and keep in mind too that even when we get measured data or we have some data, if we only have one sample of data that we have to also associate uh, a, an uncertainty with a small population size. Okay, so we have to uh, 
keep in mind as well that even if we do get material information that it does have some statistical uncertainty uh, some variance in that data as well so you as the engineer have to always keep these things in mind um, when you're when you're designing something um, you uh, must be rigorous in in your approach and keep track of the of parts of your design where you have some uncertainty or you have the potential for a safety concern and failure. Okay, so this is our big picture approach on where we are and how do we uh, evaluate a failure. And obviously we start with our static loading in cases, we find their forces, moments, torque, etc. We look at the load distributions. Uh, we look at the cross sections that are most heavily loaded and we find the stress distributions in those cross sections and then we find that stress element uh, for that point you know and that would be that three-dimensional stress element where we have the shear and uh, normal stresses acting on that point and then we can calculate the applied stress and principal stresses and maximum shear stresses okay and then we'll use these principal and max shear stresses uh, in our failure theory. Now if the material is ductile, which we're talking about ductile failure today, then we're going to calculate the von Mises effective stress. Okay, so that's some, a more conservative method. There's a couple others that we'll mention another one. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, we can pick a material and safety factor um, and then uh, go from there. Later we'll discuss if there's a crack present in a material that we have to use the stress intensity factors. Okay, and compare the uh, compare the stress intensity experienced in that material due to those cracks, uh, and compare it to the material property of the fracture toughness. So we'll talk about that. And uh, we'll talk about brittle materials uh, in in the next lecture. The main thing is, if it's ductile, we can use von Mises. If it's brittle, we can use the Coulomb more effective stress uh, to um, find out if uh, the material is going to fail or not. All right. So <clears throat> a, a material will fail in either a brittle or, or ductile member uh, manner. And remember that we also said that uh, if you have cyclical loading, which we are not talking about, we have done if you have dynamic loading, okay, and th this lecture is about static loading. But if you have dynamic loading, which we'll go into deta great detail when we talk about fatigue. Um, then ductile materials act like brittle materials and they will fail by catastrophic crack propagation and that's over 90 percent of the failure of machines so I've mentioned that before I'll mention it again uh, it's something that you have to remember um, <clears throat> so remember that ductility is is uh, classified for materials a material property and it's classified by the percent elongation before fracture all right, and we say that ductile materials are the ones that elongate at you know greater than five percent. Okay, usually it's greater than ten percent in um, in reality, but we say anything above five percent is a ductile material. Um, <clears throat> we also have a classification what we call even and uneven materials. So even materials behave the same uh, or nearly identically in both compression and tension. Okay. Uneven materials behave significantly different in compression and tension with uh, compressive forces, with uh, them being able to withstand compressive forces, much higher compressive forces. Okay, um, so we, we we don't we don't necessarily have the means to to do every test and loading condition based on um, how the material is going to be used in service. But what we usually have available is uh, axial load uh, data from you know what we've done in the, the labs for the Instron machines where we get the dog bone specimen and we get our stress strain data. And so we got to be able to relate the data that we can have for the material to the failure criteria. Okay, So there is uh, some uh, data as well for torsion and bending, but the most of the standard tests uh, is done for axial load. Um, and again, um, ductile materials will behave as brittle materials under dynamic loading. Okay, so this is the this is what a, a even and uneven material uh, looks like when we consider the failure envelopes. Okay, and these are just your uh, stress circles. This is your uh, normal stress. This is your shear stress. Okay, so if I have an even material and I uh, 
load it up to this let's say it's an axial uh, load test and I'll load it up here um, to this uh, stress value I actually get this um, stress circle here okay and then we define failure is if it fails right here then it'll also fail on this line here okay so we we say that this is our shear stress failure line here and then the even material will also fail during compression at the nearly identical stress okay so an even material the compressive strength is equal to the tensile strength okay <clears throat> and even materials tend to be ductile for example wrought steel aluminum titanium magnesium some plastics uneven materials uh, behave different in compression they can withstand larger compressive tests so if we have a tensile test here and we can go to this value in sigma and it's smaller it'll fail at lower stresses than the compressive uh, uh, stresses that it experiences. okay and materials that are uneven tend to be brittle like cast iron cast aluminum centered metal ceramics etc now these are the failure envelopes here okay for these materials okay so we don't have um, this this uh, value of shear stress okay we have this line of uh, this failure line for shear stress for uneven materials okay <clears throat> now um, it's very insightful to be able to relate these uh, standard tests such as our axial um, stress strain uh, tests for the dog bone specimen and in that case you know we always have the three three uh, states uh, three principal stresses sigma one sigma two and sigma three in a pure axial test sigma three and sigma two are zero because we're only pulling on one side okay so we have repeated roots if you were to look at that cubic stress equation at zero and then we have this uh, sigma one principal stress and what's important in, in, to recall is that when we have more circle this is actually twice the angle uh, in practice so this 90 degree angle between the principal stress and the shear stress uh, actually means in practice that 45 it's 45 degrees the max shear stress occurs at 45 degrees uh, from the principal stresses okay um, now if we have pure torsion what we're doing is we're applying a shear uh, stress to the material and that causes the more circle to go uh, up along this line and you know this this is the the stress that we experience and it has both uh, the equal and opposite um, stresses for sigma 1 and sigma 3 and sigma 2 is 0 okay so these are these are our two um, these are two commonly used tests and it's important to kind of see how um, the stress distribution um, is is different from these two tests okay all right um, at failure the principal stress is the same as the st shear stress okay but here at failure the principal stress is larger than the shear stress in fact it's twice the value okay right so the radius of this circle right is half the diameter and the diameter of more circle is this principal stress here in this case at failure for pure torsion principal stress is the same as the shear stress okay now uh, what's interesting to see is how that plays out for actual um, uh, loaded elements so this is your axial load uh, this is your more circle for an axial load we come up here and you can see that if we have a, a, a ductile material versus a brittle material that they fail in different modes okay so in this case here uh, you see that this fails at this uh, 45 degree uh, shear plane okay so it it fails in shear in this case but when we talk about the brittle cast iron uh, it it actually fails um, in the normal stress uh, orientation uh, for compression uh, in this case uh, we just define failure as it being smashed but in compression here when we have this axial load uh, it causes this uh, it causes failure along that shear plane okay which is pretty interesting now in bending um, 
in this case we just define failure as bent way too much and that's the beauty beautiful property of ductile materials is that we can uh, they don't necessarily catastrophically crack uh, at, at some point in time but they, they do bend which is a little bit safer for most designs but if you bend a brittle material then um, what you're doing is you're causing a bending stress and that bending stress is uh, you know we can find it according to the flexural formula and it acts on that cross section so it, it gives a similar uh, loading condition to the axial load where we have that normal stress failure mode okay now if we have pure torsion that's applied to uh, this material okay that that's what the more circle looks like in this case the ductile material it just like spins and spins and spins and then finally uh, breaks along that normal plane okay because the normal and shear stresses are, are equal uh, to each other in this case uh, for ductile for brittle materials however when we apply uh, a shear load we actually fail uh, all along that shear plane okay so um, if you have a component fail and you know whether it's brittle or ductile you can back out um, what what type of loading mechanism caused it to fail okay so in summary if material fails according to its weakest strength for ductile materials this is typically their shear strength for brittle materials uh, this is typically their tensile strength okay um, for uneven materials it'll typically fail in shear uh, before it fails in compression during compression tests. All right, so let's talk about our theories uh, for failure. Okay, so we have our ductile material failure theories. That's today's topic, and we have our brittle material failure theories. That's next uh, lecture's topic. And in the past, um, we had this total strain energy theory, we had this pure sh stress, shear stress theory, and we had this maximum normal stress theory. We're not going to discuss those here because we don't use those uh, in practice. Instead, what we uh, suggest that all designers use for ductile materials is this distortion energy theory because it is the most accurate when it comes to comparing its results with the um, um, actual test data. Um, we could also use also use the maximum shear stress theory, which is just a slightly different shape uh, in a two-dimensional plot of the stresses, um, and it's it's a little bit more conservative, um, so and it's a, uh, <clears throat> maybe easier to use. Um, they're both pretty simple to use. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how we got this uh, <clears throat> von Mises. Uh, stress theory it's also called the distortion energy theory and so I want to tell you a little bit about how we got uh, to this distortion energy theory um, historically people thought that parts failed because they exceeded the total strain energy of the material and the strain energy which we've described before is half uh, the stress times the strain that's the area under the curve um, for the elastic part of that material so uh, they think well if you get enough uh, strain energy then eventually the material will fail uh, however uh, people showed that uh, some materials can endure remarkably high hydrostatic stresses and that's if you know we uh, applied compressive stresses on all faces of an element at the same time and all and all of the stresses in all the directions were the same it showed um, <coughs> uh, Bridgman uh, Bridgman, Bridgman, Bridgman showed that um, like ice for example could endure stresses up to uh, uh, a million psi okay um, hydrostatic stress is actually a point on Mohr's circle so there's no shear okay so that's a repeated root at the origin of Mohr's circle if we have all stresses that are all the all the um, uh, same on a point okay and so based upon these results people will, people begin to wonder well you know we thought it was the strain energy mechanism but if we can go way higher in our stresses if we have hydrostatic stresses and um, there's something that's missing and so they uh, 
came up with the distortion energy theory, which is related to the shear stress. And then we say that things fail because of the distortion energy, not the uh, strain energy due to the hydrostatic stresses. And so we have to separate those out. So bear with me while I walk through this. Okay, so we can express that strain energy, which is that area underneath the curve for the stress strain diagram. Um, we can express that um, here, one half sigma E. Okay, so we can also rewrite that in terms of our principal stresses. If we do that, uh, we can uh, relate them. Uh, we can um, derive generalized Hooke's law here and relate the uh, strains to each other through the Poisson ratio here. Um, and then uh, represent you know E1, E2, and E3 in terms of uh, our Young's modulus and our principal stresses and the Poisson ratio for that material. Okay, so if we take this strain energy equation, we plug in the strains from the generalized Hooke's law, we get this expression here, this big expression on the bottom, um, which is the strain energy expressed in terms of our uh, principal stresses uh, and the material properties of the Poisson ratio and Young's modulus. Okay, so with that um, expression for the strain energy, then we say, okay, well, um, if there's a difference between the hydrostatic strain energy and this distortion strain energy, well then the total strain energy has to be um, composed of these two strain energies. And so the way that this uh, theory is communicated is that, well, if we express our principal stresses in terms of some hydrostatic portion of stress, okay, and then some uh, distortion portion of stress, then we can plug these values in. If we do that, uh, and we add them together, sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three, then we get this uh, three, uh, these three hydrostatic states of stress, and then the we these three distortion energy states of stress. And they say, well, in the hydrostatic stress case, let's say that all the distortion energy stresses are zero. And in that case, we can solve for what the hydrostatic stress is in terms of our principal stresses, which is just the average stress, okay? So this says there's no distortion. Uh, now, if we go back to the original equation and we plug in the hydrostatic state of stress uh, into, uh, into this equation for um, these, uh, all, all this expression, then we can get an expression for the hydrostatic strain energy in terms of the hydrostatic stress. Okay, so if we do that and then we um, work uh, plug back in our sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 over 3, then we can get this expression here. And this is an expression of the hydrostatic stress uh, in terms of the principal stresses. And we've left this distortion energy stress out. So then we can solve for the distortion energy stress by saying that, okay, well, this distortion energy stress is our strain, um, I mean, sorry, this distortion, energy, distortion strain energy is equal to our strain energy minus that hydrostatic strain energy that we just derived by assuming that we had some hydrostatic stress and um, some distortion energy stress, and we said that the distortion energy stresses were zero in this case, and we got that expression. This is that expression here. So if we take the original strain energy expression, subtract out the um, strain energy due to hydrostatic stress expression, then we should get this distortion energy, okay? And that's exactly what was done. And we came, and they came up with this distortion energy expression here. Um, that's, that is related to um, the principal stresses. Well, it turns out that it's also equal to the, um, the strain energy is, is equal to um, the yield stress squared. If we, if we say it's equal to the yield stress, the state of stress is equal to the yield stress squared, then what we can do is um, say that uh, the yield stress squared, which is equal to the strain distortion strain energy, is, is equal to this expression. And then we say, and, and we were able to introduce this just by saying, well, like, 
this is the yield stress of the material and that yield stress is related to that distortion energy okay so by doing that we get an expression for the yield stress for that material in terms of the principal stresses okay so this is for the 2d case and this is for the 3d case okay and this is our von mises uh, failure criteria so once you get your state of stress in your machine design you can calculate your principal stresses once you have your principal stresses you can just plug them into this expression here for this distortion energy criteria for uh, ductile materials and you can uh, compare it to the yield stress okay and if this value is greater than the yield stress then you're in trouble okay <clears throat> all right so this is the if we take this yield stress uh, equation uh, where this is where the material will yield um, if we take this expression um, and plot it then we get uh, this ellipse here okay and we call this the failure ellipse and this is the von Mises distortion energy okay and this is the 2d case where you have sigma 1 here and you have sigma 2 here now if we know that uh, if we have something in pure torsion then sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 and that's this line here okay so in pure torsion we would be going down this axis and we find that and for pure torsion the yield stress in shear is about 60% uh, of the yield strength okay so um, this is what it looks like if we were to take the hydrostatic stress okay and plot it and look at it the intersection uh, of sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 and we can look at that at different planes and that's how we get this uh, ellipse here this is actually the intersection of the uh, hydrostatic uh, stress um, cylinder with the two-dimensional state of stress all right <clears throat> so uh, the von Mises effective stress is this ex 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 expression here that we just derived okay that comes from this uh, distortion energy theory okay now we can also express that in terms of the principal stresses because they I mean the applied stresses Sigma X and Sigma Y and Sigma Z and tau XY tau YZ and tau ZX okay so if we have a three-dimensional state of stress we can uh, express these principal values in terms of the XYZ components of stress and shear stress on those faces okay if we have a two-dimensional state of stress um, we can express this either in terms of principal stresses or in terms of the applied stresses okay once we find this effective stress this von Mises effective stress um, we can then look at um, the safety factor and so in the safety factor is simply uh, the yield strength of material divided by the von Mises effective stress okay so if they are equal to each other then that means the applied stress that you have is going to yield the material the safety factor is one and your design is likely going to fail whenever that occurs okay so we want uh, this value here the yield strength to be greater than the effect on Mises effective stress and usually we want it to be you know at least 1.3 times better in a very tightly understood and controlled problem or go back to that table and you pick your value of your safety factor to say how much greater you want your uh, yield strength to be uh, for this design okay so we can just express you know um, the yields uh, strength over the safety factor in terms of these principal stresses okay so that's our relationship so if we um, have our yield strength we have our von Mises effective stress we can get our safety factor or if we're given the yield strength and safety factor then we can take a look at the maximum allowable stresses for that design and we can go either way with that <clears throat> okay um, and in pure shear as I mentioned we have um, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 you see that here sigma 1 and 3 in this case uh, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 okay so that's this line here on this um, failure plane and then on this principal stress 2d plane then we can see that um, 
this point here is about 60% uh, of the yield strength, and that's the yield strength in shear. Okay. Um, so if we put that point in there where we say sigma 1 is equal to minus sigma 3, we can also analytically get that same point on the graph by solving for sigma 1, and it's equal to sigma y over the root 1 over the square root of 3, which gives us the same, you know, 57%, 58% of uh, the yield strength. Okay. So that's where we get that value for uh, the shear strength of a ductile material. Okay, so often people will take the get the yield strength of a material, and then we can just multiply it by 57%. Right? Now, there, the other theory is simply that the shear strength is half the yield strength of the ductile material, and in this case, um, this is uh, instead of the 57.7% uh, of the yield strength, this is just said, oh, it's what's well, half the value because you know it's. It's here. This is a little bit more conservative. Um, <clears throat> so that's just to rate, taken directly from more circles. So if we know that the principal stress, if the principal stress is equal to the yield stress of the material, we can just say, oh, it's also equal to twice the uh, shear stress, right? Because, you know, same thing, uh, radius, diameter, twice the radius is the diameter in the more circle. Okay. So then we can just look at the safety factor in this case, and it's the the yield strength of the material, um, or in the yield strength in shear over tau max, that, that would be the shear safety factor, and this is the maximum shear stress theory. And if we say that it's only half the yield strength over the shear stress, then we just say, well, that's our safety factor, and then we express that max shear stress based upon the principal stresses for that loading condition, and we can express that in terms of uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3. Okay. That's the max shear stress theory. Now, if we superimpose those two theories onto this graph, this is what we get. Okay, so in this case, it's half, right? That's the um, max shear stress theory, and the, the ellipse here in this reddish color is the distortion energy theory. So you can see that this gray area that comes from the max shear stress basically says, you know, hey, if you uh, load up your part, well, you can load up your part all the way until you exceed your yield stress, and then you're going to fail. And the same thing over here. You load up your part, uh, you know, if you only have a single uh, state of stress, sigma 1, you have no sigma 3, then you're going to fail at the yield stress. Uh, in reality, though, we have, this, we have this actual ellipse here where we have a little bit more area here where we, if we're inside of this uh, cylinder, then we can say that the design is uh, um, not likely to fail. <clears throat> if we're outside, we say, okay, well, the machine is, uh, the design is going to fail. So this comes, uh, this is also validated um, in practice. And so uh, if you look at this data, this is taken from their book, this is the failure of some uh, um, <clears throat> ductile materials. You see their, their points here. This is the max shear stress theory. It's just these lines where we go to our yield stresses and we say that our shear stress is half and then we just draw the lines between the two. <clears throat> and it says that the, um, we, we see that these failure points <clears throat> um, occur uh, along uh, this ellipse for some of the materials. So this, you know, aluminum, um, and um, I think this is, this is a different type of aluminum and steel. So they, they seem to fall on this ellipse here. Uh, this gray cast iron, however, um, doesn't. All right. So in that case, we have to extend uh, the theory for um, brittle materials. All right. So this is an example um, that we will... Uh, a walkthrough. Um, this is example 5.1 from your book. So we'll transition over to um, the um, uh, smooth draw and I'll, I'll walk you through this.